So we'll just give a, a small uh, some words and we can continue. Sorry. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, so this is a ongoing conversation about the application of um, uh, reliability engineering uh, concepts uh, into security uh, involving risk management. Uh, it's it's not a finished product. We're not presenting a, a a new method or approach. What we're doing is we're discussing how to bring some concepts together. Uh, it's a conversation that's been running for a couple of weeks, uh, and we're going to have some more of it. Uh, so, Omar, so can you once again regale us with your, your blog that uh, you put into the chat for us? Yeah, so, um, hi, I'm Omar. Uh, I'm working at uh, SNCC, uh, Application Security at SNCC. And before SNCC, I worked for Seloto. And basically, I did both site reliability engineering and application security. And I did that for a pretty long time, almost three years. And when you do SRE for a lot of time, you learn there are pretty good practices out there and the very mature methodologies uh, regarding risk and measuring the reliability of the services you own, which is something we are not that, get, that good at, at application security. Um, and I started to think how we can apply the same methodology to the areas of application security. So for example, taking the, comp the concept of service levels to application security and try to define something similar. So if for SRE we have three, three, three terms that we define, the first is the service level uh, indicative, which tell us the metrics we want to look at, indicator, which tell us the metrics we want to look on. Uh, for example, uh, the percentage of errors from all the requests. This is some indicator we want to look at. And then we define an objective. We define what this number should be like. So we want to define that we want to have less than 2% errors per hour, for example. And now with the indicator and objective, it's really easy to say if our service is functioning or not. Basically, as long as the objective we defined is not breached, the service is functioning. And we can also define another term called agreement. A service level agreement is something that we communicate outside and it's usually a bit different from the objective. And if we have an objective of 2% error rate, we can agree or communicate outside that we uh, commit to have less than 5% errors. So when our objective is breached, we still have some flexibility before the external contract is breached. And we can have the same terms for security. We can find something that help us measure the risk of a service or a team or a product. Like for example, how many vulnerabilities the last SAS scan has found. And then we can define a risk at the objective. And the objective will be the objective will be, for example, we want each SAS scan uh, to find uh, at most three medium vulnerabilities. And the same way we can do with agreement, we can communicate either outside that we have no high vulnerabilities and internally we can accept mediums or something like that. So the same framework we can apply to application security and it gets more interesting with error budget. Uh, we all know that there is always, um, it's always hard the discussion between product and application security or, or any technical discussion, how much you should invest in tech and how much you should invest in user stories. And it's always hard to measure when it's the right time to refactor something and when it's the right time to implement a new feature. And our budget can, can, can help with that. Error budget basically look on a specific time and count how many times the objective we defined was breached. So if we looked on a month and we agree, we all agreed that we all want to have less than 2% errors. And let's say that 20% of this month, which is really bad, our service has more than 2% uh, errors, then we have 20% from our budget bond. So the error budget is that just a tool that helps us measure how many times we breached our objective. 
And by using our budget, we can have an informative discussion with everyone and looking on it and use it to make an informed decision. So we can agree that if the our budget uh, is less than 80%, for example, and we had a lot of incidents and the our budget uh, show it, it's time to invest in tech until we can be get it back, uh, back up. And having the same thing for application security risk budget, for example, uh, could help us with the same discussion because again, we all agree that security is not the only thing you should do. You should do also other stuff from time to time. And um, so this was a short summary, I hope, short. Okay, and um, I think when we spoke about this last time, um, you'd adopted some of the terminology of risk budget and, and the like, and uh, I may have reacted less collegiately about that. Um, I'm just going to show you, uh, I'm going to probably share my screen and show you a couple of diagrams I put together over some of the work I've done previously, um, just to show the uh, similar concepts, <laughs> uh, but done differently. Uh, so can everyone see the diagram on the screen? Slightly yeah. small. Any chance you can zoom in? Oh God, uh, <laughs> you're now going to ask me to do something clever. Uh, everyone needs to understand I am not very clever at this. Um, if, it's, if it's a browser, control shift plus. Yeah. <laughs> that hard. <laughs> somebody, somebody is cleverer than I. Um, so this diagram comes from the risk universe that we spoke about uh, earlier today. Uh, and this is uh, setting the scope of what the risk universe was. So at its core, it was a way of stating what a risk was, sources that lead to events that cause consequences. Um, but in a, in a more general sense, those represent a risk scenario, which is a narrative we write for our stakeholders to understand what we're talking about. But those are also driven by factors, risk factors. So risk events have frequency risk factors, which you know you can imagine if I've got more vulnerabilities, I have a higher chance that a particular risk event will be caused. And you can also have severity risk factors. You know, the difference between losing 10 records and a million records is quite a bit when it comes to regulatory fines and press coverage. Um, so risk factors are things that you can measure about your environment, which will tell you something about your risk, but they're not necessarily a direct measurement of risk. So you couldn't say that the difference between 1,500 vulnerabilities and 1,600 vulnerabilities is a, a click on the dial in your risk likelihood. All you know is it's higher, you know, in a relative sense. Underneath that, we would want to build things like um, analysis models for likelihood and consequence. That's not something we looked at in the risk universe. But I think the risk factor concept very closely maps to some of the metrics if, if you were looking into a system, you, what you could say is, you know, I have a risk of breach. I have a risk of breach from third party code that I haven't checked from suppliers or from open sources. Um, actually, I, there's probably some things in that process that I can measure that will tell you if my risk is more or less likely, even if it doesn't actually tell me exactly what the risk is. So I think there's some, there's some interesting uh, value there looking there. The other thing I was going to mention is, can you see the new diagram? Yeah. Yes. Let me light up a little bit more. Um, so this is some uh, a blog I wrote recently talking ab again about what risk is and some of the things we need to think about. And one of the big problems we have in risk generally is that people think about the consequences. They think about the impact, what goes wrong. They think about the uncertainty. So is it going to happen? Is it going to be good, bad, worse when it goes wrong? And when we do the analysis, we use our knowledge. And our knowledge is assumptions we make, theoretical models that we build, and facts we observe from our environments. And cognitive bias. Well, that comes into our expert estimation for uncertainty. But um, the knowledge is interesting because we usually gather a whole bunch of knowledge for risk assessment and then having done the assessment and produced our list of bad things that might happen, we then throw that knowledge away and we then don't let anybody who's going to make a decision on our list of bad things, look at the knowledge, but, but that knowledge and especially the observed facts that underlie it 
that is our route towards having more reliable and robust estimation of risk uh, and understanding of risk travel. So are we getting more or less risky? Um, and it, it is weird that in a world of massive big data, cyber, data science stuff, the linkage between the data that we are collecting on mass and the risks that we're thinking about hasn't easily been made. Um, the other thing to think about is that once we've done our analysis, we work out what our current exposure is in risk. How much risk am I taking? That results in two things. One is how much risk am I happy taking? You know, what was my limit? Um, if my if I breached my limit, then I'm going to go off and do an action. I'm going to turn some controls up tighter. I'm going to run a project. If I've not necessarily breached my limit, but I'm a bit uncomfortable, then what I'm probably going to say is I want to monitor that risk to know if it got bad enough that I need to go and kick off an action. Uh, and you know, I'm basically doing a very basic explanation of what a governance process should do, not necessarily what a governance process does do. Um, that risk monitoring, once again, is very rarely tied to observable facts. It's often tied to the opinions that come out of a regular risk assessment process. So I think there is a huge opportunity when we talk about some of the reliability engineering concepts to talk about the observed facts and the monitoring as a place to feed into the higher level business risks. You know, I don't think we're going to be able to and maybe I'm wrong, but I don't think we will measure or monitor directly our risk of a public breach of data from an external attacker. But I think what we can do is identify those observed facts that will tell us if that risk is getting worse or better, which you could also call risk factors. And then we can monitor for those to see if they are getting worse or better. And I think that provides a, a framework to sort of hang the two together. Um, I think this is probably as far as our conversation has got so far, isn't it, Omar? <laughs> yeah, and this is why I like the, the term indicator. It's a risk indicator, and that's what it does. It just indicates the risk, or this, I think this is pretty much what you like, like to say. Um, it's a proxy to the actual risk, because it's really hard to measure risk, but you can measure other factors that might contribute to it. Okay. How, Phil, Phil, how do you actually write these down? Because obviously part of this is, you know, you say people throw knowledge away, but normally that, that's because it's difficult to encode and get in the standard format because people, you know, are just about there with having that matrix to say uh, likelihood and impact. Um, how do you actually capture the knowledge in a way you can use? You're, you're taunting me now, aren't you? Um, oh, <laughs> risk, mat risk matrices are my bugbear. Um, well, so in whatever format was useful to you when you did the analysis, you know, it, it's hard. I, I, I don't have a great answer, I'll be honest. Um, but if I'm gathering data that tells me my number of vulnerabilities, my level of CVE scores or CVSS scores on average, my um, current state of assumed threat based on my threat intelligence, if I'm gathering that together in order to do the analysis, it's not the end of the world to write a little markdown document that says when I did this analysis these are the following facts I used. Yeah I guess what I was tying it back to is what Owen was saying about having quite a structured set of data with thresholds and limits and agreed you know all the all the pieces and and, and but there's some soft information like you said the markdown that would go alongside that. Yeah, yeah. Um, so the you know we don't have a standard for risk you know I'm, I'm doing my best but we uh, we we have a, a whole heap of different ways people think about risk. Um, we also don't have a standard for metrics. Um, and that is a whole another wicked problem that we need to solve. Um, I think... I'm sorry, I was at, I didn't want to interrupt. Continue. <laughs> uh, well, I was just going to say, I, I think your approach, Omar, is that we have, it gives us a framework in which to hang a standard set of metrics. I just put it in a quick Google slide, just that we all could make sure we all speak the same language. I can take the share screen for a second. Yeah, hang on, I need to find my way of, how do I, there we go. I think I can <laughs> just, yeah. So basically, you can do that. 
Omer, so we have real data, like what? real uh, based uh, based on that that you collected some data, numbers, the, uh, some uh, real example, for example, for that, well, for objective indicator agreement. And so I didn't get the question. Do we see the real data underlying an actual case? Have you got some an example that you can see yes, real data? Yeah. Thank you. I think for indicator, like we can start writing it down. Uh, I'm sure that, sorry for doing it now live and not preparing something before, but I think it's things we all think about. For example, I'm working for snakes. So the most obvious thing is number of, number of vulnerabilities, uh, number of one in third party packages is a clearly good one. But you can have also SAST or DAST finding, or maybe you can measure a rate, a false positive rate. So uh, Microsoft is part of their SCLC, uh, have a bunch of what they call bug bars, um, which are predefined criteria that their applications had to pass. Um, so it would be things like uh, if it had a file, uh, a file format, uh, sorry, a file parser, it would have to pass 100,000 iterations of a fuzzer. Uh, so there's lots of information within that that we could pull in uh, as examples. And this is why I also like a uh, Defect Dojo. I'm not, I don't know how many of you are familiar with Defect Dojo. It's Matt Tassaro, right? Yeah, it's, an, it's a really awesome OS project. It was Matt Tassaro who created it. Again? So I have a question. So I have a question. Like, so um, I'm like, I'm a little lost on a couple of different things. So like, so you're going to count these metrics that are these negative metrics, such as like number of vulnerabilities, number of defects, number of bugs. But like, you know, when those, when those uh, objectives, those metrics drop or they increase, how are you sure that the, it wasn't an issue with the, uh, the alignment uh, or the effectiveness of the actual instrumentation itself causing the differentiation. Like, where is the mechanism that provides the um, baseline? It sounds like you're lying to yourself in a way. Is what I mean by that is like you're looking at this number, right? But uh, but like, where did that number come from? It came from a practice of, instru of instrumenting certain things, but like. I find we have a, a lack of alignment and instrumentation in general and, and observability for that matter. Meaning I, in soft, I, I also, I also am struggling to, uh, on trying to understand how this fits in a world of complex adaptive systems and software. Um, I've, I've struggled with uh, the notion of risk in general. Uh, I've, I've tried to try to stick a step back. Is that the problem we're trying to solve? I don't know. Like, is, are, we try, are we trying to, what problem exactly are we trying to solve, right? Like, what does risk mean? Over the past 15 years, we've defined it so many different ways. Uh, I mean, like, I think the first introduction of risk, wasn't it the, uh, the orange book? Uh, it started off with the, the government or, or uh, it wasn't financials. Everybody always thinks that. Like, it became about so, that when we brought in the concept of controls and. Uh, so uh, risk risk is very well defined as a discipline um security diverged from the discipline of risk about 20 years ago the risk discipline kept developing so what we're still risk, using so i mean what kind of risk though i mean like i don't understand well, well um so there is such a thing as a risk scientist there are people who study risk the cognitive biases for the estimation of probabilities the uh, use of um uh, distributions there's a whole bunch of techniques that have been studied about human behavior and biases. The, um, the techniques of risk in the, in the nineties involved, uh, likelihood one to five impact one to five and a risk matrix. And if you were green, you're okay. If you were red, you were bad. If you were yellow, you were bad, but we're not going to talk about it. Um, and that That's was kind of made up. Sorry. That's all subjective and made up. Absolutely. And that's where 99% of security risk is today. 
but the risk pr um, profession itself has moved on. So um, they've moved much more into quantitative um, methods. Uh, those quantitative methods account for and demonstrate the uncertainty of estimation, uh, which then allows you to take decisions because ultimately risk is about making better decisions. Um, and if you are able to show and demonstrate the uncertainty of the estimate you're making, that allows people to make decisions better informed than if they believe it's really bad, cybergeddon, we must do something about it, where it's actually you've taken the worst case scenario. Um, the, I don't want to completely take over um, the, the risk budget thing, but, but there's an awful lot to risk, which we don't do in security and we, we've got a lot of catch up to do um, to get to where people who do risk elsewhere, um, operational risk, financial risk is a difficult one because they've got upside that we don't have. Um, but th there are a whole bunch of other risk techniques out there that we haven't even looked at and it's pretty simple stuff. Good I, just, source I, just feel like, I just feel like the way we approach risk in general in terms of like, you know, we got away with things like the RMF and like, you know, the all various various variety of frameworks in the late 90s and early 2000s because our systems weren't really dominated by software. I mean, now the OSI stack is all software. You know, I mean, the, the speed, scale, complexity of modern systems, it's like, you know, by the time you identify a risk, like it, it's, the system has changed 10 to 20 times. Like what are your, it's, I feel like the logic that, you, that, that the risk should be the focus and you should try to estimate. I'm not trying to. I'm not trying to score points. I'm just trying to think of the logic in my brain. Is that like we're trying to estimate for our inaccuracy of our of our instrumentation in the risk? Whereas if we're basing data on the value of the of the of the data we're getting back from from the computer, if we're basing our risk on that, like should we be trying to drive more information to yes. drive a better outcome? Absolutely. Uh, there's there's two two things I'd come say out of that. The first one is I fundamentally agree that we should be taking observable facts and explicitly building them into our models of risk. And for some reason in security, we just aren't doing that. We're collecting a lot of data and not using it. Um, I've got my suspicions and I'll maybe I'll come back to why that is. Um, so I fundamentally agree on that part. However, um, cyber risk is a slippery beast. Um, you mentioned before complex adaptive system. I fundamentally agree that I think at a macro scale, cyber domain is a complex adaptive system. I mm -hmm. think the energy level or the adaptability of our attackers defines the predictability, um, the ordered or unordered nature of the um, events we're dealing with. So a, a ransomware gang that is taking 100,000 firms out, if you've got the controls to stop them, they are not going to come back and have another go because they've got another 99,000 firms to well, go and here, do it with. Here's the premise that, I, here's the premise that I have trouble can with. I just, yeah. Can yeah. I just finish the step up? Sure, no, sure. Go ahead. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, the, ne the next step up is a, um, I've, I've cocked up, I've got a vulnerability sitting on the outside, criminal gang stumbles across it, takes best advantage. You know, They will have a go, they'll get as far as they can get, but if a better opportunity comes up, they'll take it. And then there are the guys where I've got something they want and they're prepared to spend the time and money. And they will adapt everything they do to me, to my control environment. The first bunch, the ransomware guys, I can, I'm reasonably confident I can predict ransomware behavior three, three to five years out. The guys who are opportunistic and will take my, my vulnerabilities one to three years. The, the targeted guys, I don't think I can predict. And the targeted guys, I've got to do other things. So when it comes to ransomware, I can write a checklist. We follow that checklist, we're probably done because we know the problem, it's an issue. The opportunistic guys, we do threat modeling, we do risk modeling, we take some experts in the room and say, what do you think we should worry about and put our money on? And we, we take our gamble. The targeted guys, we watch the environment, we respond to the environment, we learn from the environment, we as things at work, we keep doing them. Resilience. And resilience. Uh, hunting, whatever you, you might do in that 
learning state. I think the interesting thing about risk is it is good in that ordered but complicated environment where you are thinking that you can probably predict the future, but you need a bunch of experts to do it. it it's unnecessary when you know what the issue is and it ain't going to work when it's so complex. Sorry, I just wanted to lay out where I think risk fits in. No, I, I, I think uh, you're getting the, 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 the butt end of uh, my frustrations uh, for a long time here. Is that like, you know, like there's so much focus on adversaries, right? Like, I don't really care, to be honest. I mean, like there's so many focus, so much focus on uh, threat intelligence, uh, which is, in my opinion, a lot of that is complete horseshit. Now there is an element of nation state stuff. And you're at the biggest bank in, in, in the world, right? You got to pay attention to some of that, right? But like the majority of that malicious code is crap, right? The problem is, is that our tax services are uh, allow that crap to, to execute. And if you look at, you Google any, any, you know, uh, if you Google any like click jacking attack or any mass assignment attack and you look at, if you look at this, the steps in the code is some dumbass thing that's got to exist, like so an open port, uh, a permissive account. Uh, so my, I guess what I'm going to try to come out here is like, we should be focusing on driving an increased level of, of understanding of our own systems behavior and our own securities behavior before we do anything else. Because like, uh, you focus on attacker and threat intelligence all day, but that doesn't mean you've, you've, you've you, you, like, you focused on, yeah, you're up, to, you're up to date, but you're still vulnerable, right? Like, like is, am, I, am I making sense, what I'm saying? Yeah, 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 you absolutely are. One thing I will say is you've just done a risk assessment. So you've gone out and looked at a bunch of data and come back and said, that doesn't matter and this does. And, and I, you've now got a mental model that has prioritized one set of actions over others. Now, you know, here we are a bunch of people who, you know, we're clever, we're experienced, we understand the problem, we can probably do reasonably good things. The broader security industry is not for the people like those that attend the Open Security Summit. And um, I'm being a bit unfair, but that's why models exist and that's why frameworks exist, because there's a whole bunch of people out there who don't understand how to ask the question you're asking. They don't build, they run. They, they take a, a document off the shelf and they do 80% of it because that's what they can get funded, you know, and that's, that's where a lot of the industry's at. Yeah. Um, now, I will say, you know, you are absolutely right. We should know, I, I do agree, if we know more about how our system should operate and more about how actually we expect operates, them. Actually operates, not should, actually operates. It's the it's, line yeah, should yeah. and actually so you know I, i'm with dan gear on this you're secure when you've minimized your unmitigated surprises um so you know how do you, you do that how do you build ah. like <laughs> i mean these so this is uh i've been mean, like uh we didn't do backgrounds intros but i'm the creator of security chaos engineering well mayor knows me as a result of that like i'm currently writing the o'reilly book on it right now and i i struggle with some of these concepts and and the chaos engineering is, um, it allows you to ask the computer the question, right? Hey, I believe when X occurs on my system, I've designed Y to be the result, right? So test it, ask the computer the question, right? It's not a test. What you're trying to do is you're trying to ascertain whether or not the system worked however you thought it did. All right, you, I don't know if anybody here has read Sidney Decker's Drift Into Failure, but, but, uh, our systems, this isn't engineering and security is a component of that, like is a messy exercise, right? I mean, we slowly drift to a state of unknown very quickly into a system. Is that like you have all, you have, um, you know, your first week of going live with the system, marketing comes down and says, hey, we got the pricing model wrong, we got to refactor. You know, the next yeah. day after that, Google hires your, your, your best software engineer. The day after that, you have an outage on the payments API and the hard-coded token. It slowly, your system slowly becomes stable actually through these unforeseen events, right? But like chaos engineering allows you to inject a known condition into the system that you believe to be known. In a line the mental model, you talk a lot about mental models, like allows you, because um, the only way to actually understand a complex system is to interact with it. You can't, a human cannot accurately, accurately mentally, um, not mentally, model the behavior. You have to interact with it. I don't know if you ever uh, uh, looked at the Kinefin framework from Dave Snowden, yep. but, um, but um, my point is, is like, is like, I don't, I feel over behind the eight ball on, I, I feel like 
no matter how sexy we get at risk, if we don't get better at instrumenting and build a better data set to base these things on, I mean, we're, I think we're spinning our wheels. And that is even I, I, observability. Like, I mean, I like, absolutely agree. security logging sucks, man. Like, there's no solution for that. You know? Chaos yeah. engineering is just another SRE practice. Yes. Yeah. engineering is usually the second step you do after you have good um, SLO and SLI is defined because before you, what you called know how my system should work is basically the idea behind those service level metrics. The service well, level I mean, most metrics. SLOs are made up, by the way. Most of them okay. are made up, right? If you ever look at some, ask any company or any SRE, what's your SLO? Right, and they'll be like 400 milliseconds, right? 100 milliseconds, right? Why, why do they all seem to be divisible by 100, right? Like, well, you they made it up, right? Like, it's not an explicit or implicit SLO. It's not the actual, like, how much latency can the system take? How much, you know, how much ri uh, we're at risk? Uh, we keep talking about risk. How much, uh, how many, uh, this kind of 400 errors can the system take? Like, that's the purpose of chaos engineering. Let's say you say you want your SLO to be 300 milliseconds, and then you go and take down the, take down the main database. If your SLO does not break, there is a problem. So SLO, so SLO does not have to break, right? So it's actually quite interesting is that if you introduce multiple, well, we're getting into the wrong thing here, but like if you it's introduce, if you, introduce uh, if you ask different service owners in a microservice architecture, what is your SLO? 300 milliseconds, 200 milliseconds. Okay, what happens if I introduce multiple services up and just below the SLO? That's, that'll be fine, right? Because you said that's your SLO, right? Um, when you actually do that, it you tri typically triggers a catastrophic failure or a cascading failure. Yeah. Um, right. But I'm below the SLO. But that's a- oh, you're, you're spot on, though, Mary. You're spot on. I'm just- I'm just fussing with you, man. It's cool. No, no, it's very good. <laughs> no, no, no. Very good is, um, discussion, which we should have one time. But uh... so this was something I was thinking about. You mentioned Kenevin. Um, the new one. The new one just came out, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I Dave tells me off for using non-specific language, but uh, I'd like to feel like I'm following the ideas. Um, but. Uh, <sighs> Oh, this is, yeah, this is, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, I've got no liminality in here and I'm not talking about Apira or other things that often my stakeholders would have to go and look up. Maybe instead of being a pain in the ass, maybe I could just ask some questions, right? So like, yeah. um, so why is it, so like risk management, let's talk a little bit about risk management here. So like if, so let's say it to the software team, right? Like, why is it always that like, when a risk is identified by current standards, right? Like it's either some vulnerability or some control flaw or that you, you can't either fix or you have, to, you have to take some kind of remediation type of action and somebody's got to make a decision and assign some sort of arbitrary low, medium, high, low, high, medium, high, 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 or like, or make up a number with like with fair does. It just makes up a number or, or puts a dollar figure to it. Um, but like, why is it that like the, the risk then, uh, precipitates the na or navigates towards the direction of people who don't understand said risk, right? I mean, the, the risk is really only understood by the people that built that system, especially at today's speed and scale. I mean, it's impossible for, you know, uh, us to materialize and understand when we're not even interacting with the system. Like we're making guesses, we're, we're, we're applying models to real data and we're trusting the model over the real data. Like, and we're, we're trusting our better opinion from something that's subjective versus objective data that an engineer who understands the system is telling us, you know, I, I, I can fix this right now. Like, but we'll spend a week, uh, uh, you know, escalating the, the risk up to the CISO. So, you know, we get on the Friday morning call. You know, I was the chief security architect for United Health Group. It used to have it every Friday, right? It was a game too. People want certain risks. They would, they move it up to a high. So we'd go to Robert. So he'd have to make a decision. Right. And meanwhile, that system has changed a hundred times. Right. Yeah. Like, you know, what are you approving? And Robert, you don't even understand what they're talking about. You're making a decision. I'm not beating up a Robert. I'm just like, he's making a decision on something. You know what the fuck he's talking about. So 
risk is useful for what it does, which is taking a complicated but ordered problem and allowing you to prioritize your application of resources over uh, that you have available. If you can fix everything and, it, and there's no prioritization decision, don't do a risk assessment. You know, it, it doesn't help. Um, if you know what the problem is, you know what the solution is, what the hell do you need a risk assessment for? Because you just solve it. Um, and I think one of the big problems we've had in security is that we've either had a compliance head, in which case it's a checklist, it's simple. You do this and we're done, which doesn't fix anything. So then people go, oh, well, that didn't fix anything. Let's do risk. Everything's a risk. Well, no, it isn't. But now we spend our time working out whether or not we should patch. We should patch. What? Why, why are we working that out? Um, but then we end up in this world where actually some bad stuff does happen. You know, a, a, a wanna cry, which is eminently predictable, becomes a black swan that nobody saw coming. Um, and we, we're unprepared to learn from the experience of something happening and, and adapting to it and surviving to it. I would argue that actually security management is about balancing just doing stuff thinking about stuff and whether or not you should do it and just surfing and, and trying to survive and stay out the other side. And the problem is we veer from one model to the other and no one model works. So over time we keep veering rather than applying the right decision-making to the right problem. And there are some problems for which risk is a good decision-making tool. Patching something is not a good place to do risk assessment. Doesn't, it doesn't make sense. I've talked a lot, so I'm not. I'm gonna. I'm gonna. I'm gonna defer my time to somebody who's not full of hot air. Because that's me. No, no. I think this 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 conversation keeps doing this every time we have it. Uh. <laughs> no, it's this is hard. This is hard. There is no answer. That's why it's hard. And like, I think I think looking at resilience engineering, look at safety engineering, look at cognitive systems engineering. Uh, uh, like, there is a lot there to learn, right? Like about. I mean, um, you know, about this, you know, I just, it, it, it's to translate a lot of material over to like, for example, safety differently from Cindy Decker likes to talk about, you know, we, we're so focused on counting the negatives and describing what went wrong that we never actually take the time to understand why things go right. Right? So um, if you ask some, safety too. Safety too. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So if you ask, and often if you ask some, yes, you know, an engineering leader or, or, or uh, you know, uh, whoever, an ops leader, whatever, you ask them like, wow, like, how do things go right? And they'll, they'll proceed to explain how things go right in terms of how things don't go wrong. Right. <laughs> we're so, we're so tuned to think that way. Right. But like, we don't bother to consider like, you know, for example, we, for years, we used to point the finger at humans human error and things like that, that is fundamentally absurd, right? Meaning that it's humans that create security. Without humans, there wouldn't be any security. Wouldn't be any reliability, wouldn't be any quality. You're human constructs, right? Like, you know, um, but it's like, uh, it, 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 case in point is the guardrails, okay? So we always used to use this term guardrails and design guardrails into a system. Well, um, typically we designed said guardrails uh, with a poor understanding of the system to, to begin with, let alone it's typically also somewhat stateful uh, in a stateless world. And what guardrails end up becoming are, are handcuffs in the situation uh, where the system is uh, encountering an unforeseen event. Oh, I didn't foresee that. Oh, and I, now I can't break glass. Shit, right? Like, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. you know, um, you become more fragile. And I'm not going to start quoting Taleb, but you become more fragile by becoming more rigid. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I think we're violently agreeing. Well, yeah, I think <laughs> uh, no, we are, actually. I, I, I do agree that understanding the environment and being able to understand what measurements of the environment are telling us are critical. I still think there's probably a case for helping people make decisions sometimes, which is basically what risk is. When it's a ritual and a bureaucracy, it doesn't really help anyone. When it's a tool for helping someone make a decision, then it's, then it's worth doing. Um, the problem is we've turned, we've turned it into a ritual. We've turned it into a high priesthood of risk analysts. 
Well, it's an attractive, it's attractive idea, right? Because other than this concept of risk, where we keep attaching, a lot of times we, we attach way more value to it than it deserves is because the only other thing we kind of have is the breach that didn't occur this month or this quarter, right? Oh, if you go to the board over and over and over again, it's like nobody wants to hear it. the outage didn't happen, the incident didn't happen. It's, but risk has become, well, it's, 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 it's what people want to believe it's become. It's not what it's actually become, but it's become our mechanism to try to explain business value for security to other people. But the fundamental premise, what we're basing said risk on is flawed. And like, we should actually be trying to drive security into the value chain, right? Directly into making products and part of making things. Uh, you know, if we want to explain, and we should be measuring, what we really should be measuring is, is um, security's contribution to business KPIs. Yes. So interesting. I, I do talk sometimes about value of security um, at the moment. And, and maybe this is just my experience is that there is a very small amount that security adds to the top line of any business, which is basically a avoidance of screwing up and increasing cost of customer acquisition to some degree. But generally top line has very little benefit from security. Bottom line the costs to keep the business running is a delicate balancing act for security. On one hand, there is the cost of security, the people that do it, the tools they buy, the limits they place on growth. That's a cost that we need to minimize, but the cost that most of us see as our job and some CISOs see it as only the, the only part of their job is avoiding unplanned in-year expenditure breaches mm. that's all breaches are you, you go talk to a chief financial officer if he had put that money in the accounts he doesn't care that a breach occurred because we just paid for it it was in there what he cares about is that two million five million ten million costs that popped out of the woodwork and he, he had to restate his accounts and change his plans and defund a bunch of activities to cover it um and so often i would say the value security is bringing is a combination of minimizing the direct cost of security on the bottom line while minimizing the unplanned in year expenditures. Well, and I would also, I would also add to that. Where's the, where is the objective verification that that spending is actually a functional thing? What I mean by this, you got that nice Palo Alto firewall. Yeah. We spent money, but does, is it aligned? Like, you know, uh, software engineering teams are deploying, uh, circuit breaker patterns, boot redeployments, you know, and we're, we're deploying big fat Palo Alto firewalls in AWS and, and we're, we're not keeping up with the rest of the environment. Oh, but we, we bought that thing just cause you spent that money. I mean, like there's a lot of subjectivity. I mean, you've got to try to drive, build confidence through instrumentation, science, engineering, like it, all like instrumentation is key. This COVID COVID thing is a huge example of that, right? Without testing, you don't know if you got it. Right. Like, you know, it's the same thing without testing your security controls. You're blindly saying, I built this at said date. I update it. It gets signatures or whatever, but I've never actually introduced the condition by which I expect it to operate. Right. Like, and so, yeah. Another one of my bugbears. And one of the reasons why I think risk fails so often, one of the reasons why I think metrics fail so often. And one of the reasons why we probably don't spend as much time thinking about how things are actually working is that because of the level of uncertainty around cyber events we know something's going to happen we don't know which one we don't know where because of that level of uncertainty and because our stakeholders don't understand what we're talking about and in many cases the security profession avoids feedback we spend as much time as possible not getting feedback on our actions you know we will spend six oh, months yeah, a security program. yeah but we won't put we won't spend six months measuring whether it worked and that lack of feedback means that we don't get you know in the classic OODA loop where the feedback comes from every stage of the cycle we don't have it we're blind we take action and we have no idea if it matters and an awful lot of the problem with the subjectivity of risk is it's a mental model in people's heads who've never seen any measurement of the benefit of any of the actions they've ever taken Right. 
Right. That's the problem. They just, the absence of negative, they just know the absence of negative events. You know, yeah. it's like, and when you discover that something didn't work, man, that is too late. Right? I mean, like, you don't know when that event actually began. A lot of times with like, I don't know, I've, I've worked, uh, this is actually, I mean, I don't know if we're, I don't know how to do these sessions, but like, I kind of, like, but like, I'm actually really enjoying this conversation um, because the, w w the conflict in thinking, because I'm actually really passionate about trying to get the, a better outcome here, like, mm -hmm. and uh, the conflict is representative of the confusion in the business. I mean, like, you know, we're, so everybody's drunk on some kind of Kool-Aid. I'm just not sure. I, I, don't, I don't know. I'm just not sure we're taking the right approach. And, and my, 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 my um, concerns come, come down to the state of adoption of software and how it's just taken over everything. And it took it over faster than the security community could catch up. Yeah. And we don't have, I mean, I have not talked to a company that does software security logging well. It's a very hard problem, right? Like with, that, with the absence of observable events, you have to rely on instrumentation. And our instrumentation is not exactly good. We still rely on a lot of subjective like questionnaires, things like that. There are humans giving responses about a computer, but the human may not understand the question. You know? I don't know. Yeah, yeah no, I absolutely agree. Um, I, I do think there is, you know, it's, here's a great example. Um, no standard right now, security standard, control framework, risk assessment framework, mentions compliance as code. That is something that came out of practitioners <clears throat> in tech first, cloud first businesses trying to solve a problem. Um, measured the environment, make changes into the environment, automate it, took away a whole class of manual activity that security teams and other businesses are doing. I think there is an opportunity around improving the measurement of observable facts, the metrics, the um, measurement, the instrumentation of the environment in order to do risk as code. Uh, and I'm, you know, I, there's a lot of work to be done to make that work. And there's models that need to be created to try and say, <clears throat> these inputs we think generate these sorts of outputs in most cases. So therefore we have a model here. But, but isn't, uh, isn't a lot of risk a judgment? So, I mean, what, you know, when you look at the, the quantification of risk, when you, you're getting the board to commit, because at the end of the day, it's, it's about appetite. You're getting people to, to arrive at a uh, common understanding of what that risk is if you, uh, when, when, you're, when you're coming up with a value. Whereas with compliance, you've got some, some kind of direct thresholds and uh, things you can check on. So isn't this more about the social dynamics of an exec uh, deciding what they're going to do with risk? At the end of the day, I think it's it, it's kind of a mix. The it's an exec wanting someone to give him the business context to make a decision that he doesn't understand. As Aaron was saying earlier, they don't understand the systems they're deciding no, about. No, so no. Somebody give me an easy thing that's red, amber, or green. A trust, a trusted voice that says yeah, yes or no. But that's a, like but, but the other side of it is we don't have the data to drive it in the first place. Um, so we are we are making judgments on data and then we're suppressing our uncertainty to provide it to a bunch of people who don't understand what we're talking about to make decisions and ultimately risk is a decision. days later days later a difficult yeah. time later right now m m most of what we're doing there is some form of either in our head or in a spreadsheet model that takes input data and outputs a a comparative prioritization most of the quantitative measures are about how you minimize or expose the biases in the mental models. Yep. Uh, and by doing that, you improve the judgment being made. The way we improve the biases in the actual models is by measurement and environment. Uh, and well, so you, you take your estimates and you measure what actually happened and then you calibrate it later. You do that. So you, you go it's back. A, that's and what you... it's about. It's about, re it's about calibration, right? Yeah. Like, like the thing where you're talking, it's not about like risk is code per se, like uh, where you, where the risk comes in. I, I love thinking about that. I mean, I, I'm not saying you're off on that. I'm just saying I, I, we're, we're going down a path. That I think it's interesting is, is that, you know, it's like, you know, uh, if a business does not change, make any changes, 
it's risky. If it makes the wrong change, it's risky. It's like, it's, but there's this need of like, so uh, we identify an issue, right? Should we have this huge process and, and, and weight on, on top of that identified issue? Or should it be, well, should we be measuring the ability to recalibrate, the ability to change quickly? Meaning like empowering, like, like I, it should be about like identifying our ability to, uh, to improve an engineer's ability to respond to the issue. Like, in, in, is that, am I making sense? Like, we yeah, should not yeah. be driving risk up. We should be, I mean, we, I, I get it. I was an executive. We have to, I am an executive. But I, we have to, <laughs> so you, gotta, you gotta know kind of like, hey, how we doing? But like, but th this, how am I doing in terms of bad risk? Does it balance out well with how I'm doing with revenue? Like, so, so I, like, was gonna, yeah. I was going to say, take an example of someone that where it's a business that's all about risk. So is it, yeah, you know, financial trading company, you've got people trading on account. So you've got a very good measurement at the end of every day or at the end of every week or end of every quarter, how people have done and your, your position in the company or your ability to do more trading uh, comes, comes in and you know, what people are doing, they're taking some very, you know, uh, you know, they're making subjective value uh, judgments on risk and it then bears out and it's not just rolling the dice that there are people who are consistently good at that. So the problem is how do you take that and put that, um, that ability to trade in foreign exchange or commodities, how do you put that into a cyber environment where there's such a different language being spoken? And when you measure the actual impact, it's not as clear cut as a kind of like a, a dollar account at the end of the day. So I don't, I don't think you do. I don't think you apply that, that model to, I mean, like, I think we have to, I think we have to take a software based approach. What are we assessing? What are we trying to, like, what are we, what are we, what are we trying to assess the risk of anymore? You could just say software, the network. I mean, those are the only two things we have anymore. Like, I think it's gotta be a software based approach. Like if not, we're never going to be like software is unique in its construct. It's one of the only human constructs that fundamentally changes after it's been delivered as a product. Like, does that make sense? Like it's one of the, um, I don't know if you guys have read the No Silver Bullet. It talks about, uh, it was a paper in the 1980s that talks about the nature of complexity in software. And the, there's two schools of thought is, is really, you can't actually reduce complexity. You can only navigate it. And there's a lot of conversation to risk with that too. It's like, you can't actually really reduce risk. You're kind of moving it around, right? And it's really about navigating it. And there's also the research bears out that organizations that encounter more risk, more accidents, are actually safer. They have fewer catastrophic accidents. Well, that's chaos engineering. Back to what uh, Emma was saying earlier. Oh, well, it's not. It's not chaos engineering at all. Anyway. It's adaption or... Oh, there's another name for it that Dave uses, and it'll it tell me off. But um, it, it's basically the ability to adapt and learn. Um, by having a series of failures, you are better at handling failure. <laughs> um, so, yes, by avoiding risk, you haven't learned how to handle risk. So when risk occurs, you're screwed. Um, get it. Absolutely get it. Um, but there is also a difference between, you know, uh, uh, half of your critical people being out sick and a pandemic you know you, you, but, you but, yeah sorry but just going back to what you're saying you know risk as code so compliance as code i get because you can set some clear thresholds and you can then measure it a bit like what omar was saying when we started this conversation but when you look at risk um i think everyone's agreeing here that risk is uh, in cyber is inexact and it doesn't match up to the way that businesses handle other risks in their business so the, the, I mean, it, it'd, be, it'd be great if we can, but I, I think there's such a subjective human element in the judgment of risk. What you're better off doing is getting what you've talked about, Phil, which is getting people together and getting to consensually say what their risk appetite is and where the risk curve is, and then having some way of, of calibrating that downstream to say, was I right or was I wrong? And I mean, I've, I, I haven't done this explicitly for risk. I've, I've done it in portfolio management of projects where you get estimates and you get returns. And people are going kind to of work out what those things are. And the only way of getting it to work is to get a, a, a group together where their combined experience. And once you've gone through a number of cycles and you some small survivable failures, then you get much better at doing that. You kind of narrow the, the cone of uncertainty. So narrowing the cone of uncertainty is an interesting phrase. I think 
in some cases we may be able to narrow or reduce the biases in the estimation um, but in many in most cases I think what we it, what we were avoiding doing what we need to do is to show our uncertainty yep. in order that when a decision is made what that means so a good example is you know we've talked previously that people seem to think of risk as likelihood and impact something might happen and when it does it will hurt us it's not it's it's uncertainty consequence and knowledge and it's the knowledge that we take into that estimation that helps us define what the risk is if our knowledge is poor if our knowledge is weak our estimation is weak now here's an interesting thing people talk about black swans and the the things that you can only estimate in hindsight you can write blogs about them don't they <laughs> no, no, I don't. um but the there's an interesting thing which is an awful lot of risks that take people by surprise they knew about and they written down somewhere but they were existential risks to their business this could kill us but it will never happen and therefore we'll ignore it and but what's interesting is when you actually go and look at the knowledge that they use to estimate that it would never happen the knowledge is very weak now there's a good heuristic there which is any risk that is presented to you, which is existential, for which the knowledge is weak in making an estimate, do something about, because you don't know it's rare. And, and sorry, and the knowledge, are you saying that knowledge is, is um, it's the bias applied to that knowledge? Are you saying that the, the depth of the knowledge, the, the you know, the, the strength of the knowledge. So is it reliable? Is it robust? Is it accurate? Is it precise? You know, all of those various characteristics you can measure in the knowledge. So your your risk analyst who is removed from the system or removed from the environment several steps says we've never seen it before we don't know another company has ever been hit by it therefore it's probably not going to happen because it's never happened before but they're basing that on best guesses and some google searches if that risk happens it ends your business are you happy with that being a very low high that doesn't need to be treated we're not going to do anything about that. It costs a lot of money. Never yeah, going to happen. You made the point about that, which is there are some there are some of these um, you know risks which you can't you can't provision against, you can't mitigate against. You just have to be prepared to try and weather the storm. So that's some risks that. some risks are outside your control. They're external risks. They're going yeah. to happen no matter what you do. Yeah. When those risks happen, you need to be able to survive them. Yes. If you've got an external risk for which your knowledge, your strength of knowledge when you estimated it was poor you didn't have good data that you need to prepare for that you know it stops being a risk conversation becomes a resilience conversation how do i survive yeah. it when it happens right because it will because and, it will and, and that's because the cost of your resilience is uh, is lower than uh, over time right. than the cost of of mitigating those risks so it that's a, that should be an explicit calculation saying you know if you actually look at what we'd have to provision so the example is building a completely separate data center or a completely separate trading floor and having a full set of staff able to, to work it, you know, I mean, just in a business continuity sense. And I mean, then you, you, you would never do that. So you, you accept some degradation in your capability, but it's survivable. And what you are saying is well, you do have other risks. Would I spend that money if I thought it was quite likely my existing provision was going to burn down next week? Right. Yes. So I'm saying I don't think it's very likely my existing provision is going to burn down this year, but my my people who are telling me that guessed. Yeah. Okay. So I'm just trying to bring it back to the original conversation because Omar was talking about having a very mechanistic budget where you're looking at those impacts on a micro scale and and eliminating those things as you go through. So you've actually got something that you're uh, talking about this calibration. You're not waiting for the the hundred year wave. You're doing, you know, a hundred waves a week um, on on this stuff. So that was the, the, you know, uh, when, when we talk about how we actually stand this up, whether you do, when you're talking about risk as code, or you're talking about how you measure it, I'm quite interested in what's the framework you put in place to actually show that. To you know, what's the what's the mechanism you, you put in place? Because I, I see some products which are very um, ambitious in their scope, and I think, you know, would I really want to run my business on that? which is why there is judgment involved and there is mental models and there's people because there are things for which we don't yet have good mechanistic models for and for things that for which if they are truly complex adaptive systems we can never have a mechanistic model for 
Um, you simulate by building the thing you, you are. Um, but there are opportunities. So, for example, with robust instrumentation and data coming out of the environment and a, and a concept of how those measurements relate to outcomes, risk outcomes, but those are based on human judgment. Well, human judgment, we found, is probably best represented using Bayesian methods. So you build a Bayesian network and you start pulling that data together and it comes and tells you that thing you were worried about last week and you, you were really worried about, it's twice as bad. You know, and it's, as, I'd say it's as simple as that. It's doable. Yeah, I, I, but, but I think there are very few businesses that are going to take that sophisticated mathematical approach. I mean, there are some scale businesses that would, but to actually incorporate that Bayesian analysis on something that you're, you know, at the moment is a pretty simple five by five risk uh, a heat map or it's a risk register. I mean, there's, I think there's a number of steps you'd want to do. I'm, I'm not going to use the word risk maturity curve, but um, there is a, there's a set of things you'd really want to do to, to try and uh, improve things before you get to that end goal, aren't there? I mean, it's, there's almost a primary say, where are we today and what should we be doing? Because I think there are some, probably some yes. previous steps that are more, uh, uh, we, we, can do, we can be better at doing the wrong thing absolutely yeah and we can greatly improve our ability to do the wrong thing step by step um or we sit down and work out the right thing and we yeah. do it badly but then we do that better and better and better over time yeah and i would say you know look at the world we're in right now you're either working in a business where everything's sitting in a cloud platform you're you're building products being run by engineering teams that are driving um, technological change because they understand their customer and they understand the benefits they're bringing to them. Or you're sitting in a honking great big business that thinks it does something else, who has a bunch of contract developers in a third party in India, cranking out crap code to a bunch of requirements that were useful two years ago, you know, and you're somewhere in between those two. <laughs> You know, and so that's a glide path business. It's just the point of impact is at some point in the future, but there is a point of impact. But continually improving a glide path business, or do you jump into the future and say, right, let's do the thing we should be doing right, which is why am I running tin, for example? But, but I think probably the problem here is you've got to win the argument with the exec as to why to do this. And we've got a pretty esoteric conversation going on here with some people with a lot of experience. Um, how do you persuade that board that this is the way to do it? So, you know, maybe you have a chance if there's an actuar actuarial uh, strand there or some trading group that understand risk, but how do you do that when you're talking about something that is, back to your uh, earlier point, Aaron, they don't, uh, they don't give a cobblers about the systems, they don't understand the system. So when you're, you're trying to present this in a way that, that um, is a, a, proper, uh, you know, a proper technique, but then, you know, how do you get them to bet the business on it? So I, mean, I think you, I, don't. Yes. I mean, I, I, one of the themes that I've been just kind of thinking about here in my silence, because I, I talk too much, uh, is uh, wouldn't it be great if it was about confidence and not about risk? I mean, like, how confident am I, am, am I like, through the data that I've derived, to, to how confident am I am that, that my security is functional? There's like a, there's like a level, like, there's just a level of, there's just a different level of assurance you feel when you know you've actually injected that condition and you do it a hundred times a day, right? Like don't, don't think of it as like a security step. Just think of that instrumentation, COVID testing. You're doing it a hundred times a day, right? Like, and but you're more confident that, hey, if this other stuff that other people are watching with threat intelligence happens, hey, we do that every day. And we know for a fact when that occurs, like instead of tr coming up with what might happen what you know and, and what might happen as a result of that happening and then attaching dollar values like what are we doing to actually ensure the stuff we got to protect this is is good i mean are we are we confident it's about reducing that uncertainty like yeah. in the process yeah. you can reduce costs though too but like, hey or you said it phil phil you said phil uh, it's 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 about continuous learning and it's learning through deriving more information better information and it's not just data it's the humans that have to build the security and do the engineering having better context about how well uh that security actually functions i don't know we got yeah, somewhere yeah. in this conversation i think 
Yeah, so, no, in, uh, Ben, can I jump? Can I just get in? So I've been wanting to get in for about ten minutes now. Sorry, um, you look like you've fallen over, Alan. Yeah, no, I'm I'm sat down. It's been one of those days, and I'm sat back in my gaming chair, leaning backwards. So apologies. No um, the the likelihood bit where where um, Aaron was just going in terms of reducing that uncertainty, I think that's the weak in a risk, risk argument at the moment. Phil, you were saying that, you know, our ability to predict is poor. You know, we can't really do better than low, medium or high because things just happen. And I think, I think it's the speed of um, change in our risk profile that goes from things are within tolerance to all hell's broken loose. It could be in a matter of right, seconds is probably exaggerating, but it can certainly happen in minutes because I think that's the challenge that um, the cyber events bring to the business is that they're not used to having to make decisions in that time frame that we have to to stop the business burning down and they're reluctant to give us the delegated authority to act quickly which is why do I say it things like Maersk and the, the ransomware taking them offline in in minutes because actually they haven't done that existential event. They've taken the view that to lose two data centers within, was it seven minutes, I think? It was something uh, so, of that order. Um, Racket Ben Kisser lost all production data centers and all backup data centers uh, and 80% of laptops in 20 minutes from first infection were not better. Yeah, because, and I think that was because they had active, active data centers with no pause was, between the two. It was backups as well. Yeah. And, okay. and it, so, because they did that thing that government does very well. They didn't do that thing that government does very well, which is to say, hang on, you can administer both the important bit and not the important bit. That means the weakness of the not important bit is going to compromise the important bit. Government Correct. kind of tends to handle that, but it costs a lot of money, whereas commercial businesses don't. Um, no. But that was interesting because that was an event that came outside of their experience. Yes, so their it experience was existential. Was that you had to patch the software you got from third parties as quickly as you could, because otherwise those exploits would get used. Mm -hmm. And and in the end, they were attacked via the patch. And yes. that, that was a problem because their model of thinking about what could go wrong and was based on what they'd seen and they hadn't previously seen that event. They hadn't thought about it. Yes. Yeah. So sorry, I call that a left field event because most people, sorry, I know that's being right handed. It's you know, the left side is your weaker side because you're tending to look on the right. That's why it's. I think it comes from baseball, actually. I think it's, that's why it's called a left field event. But it's that unpredictability that I suppose actually, is, sorry, I'm thinking out loud. That's where you get your black swan, isn't it? It's that thing that you may have spotted or you may not have spotted. But because you haven't given it the, the focus to realize quite what effect it might ha have were it to happen, that you dismiss it. Because in some senses, because it's an existential, it's too big a problem for you to deal with. But I think in the cyberspace, that's actually what we're dealing with a lot of the time, which is why where Ben was going, I think around, well, therefore it's the importance of resilience, that ability to weather the storm, to be able to operate in a high signal to noise ratio environment rather than a low signal to noise ratio. I think that's where we've got to take the conversation but to, to Ben's question about how do we have that conversation with the execs, we have to link it to what their business objectives are. So it has to be to maintain their revenue stream, to maintain their cash flow, to maintain their communications with customers and suppliers. They have to invest in a resilient, I'm going to go with IT architecture, to keep the business running. There are very few businesses now that can operate without their IT because even their payment systems probably rely on it. So the, what that means is you need to be able to go to the exec and say, things I can't predict everything that's going to happen to us, and some of those things I can't predict could kill us. And I want you to fund me to make us safer, 
to make us survivable, adaptable to things that I can't predict that will kill us. And a good CISO and a clever set of execs who, who are thinking beyond the next annual cycle can have that conversation. It's a very difficult conversation to have if, if the Caesar doesn't get it and if the execs don't get it. Oh, well, I agree. I think, I mean, I was listening to Hayden earlier. If, you're, if your business focuses on surviving into the next quarter, you probably can't afford a resilient architecture. Or, if if your, bonus, got... or your bonus depends on a certain uh, threshold spend. Ah, well, okay, hang on. Now we're getting into, well, actually, that's where their corporate governance is wrong because the corporate governance should be rewarding them for their performance three years ago, not their performance this year. Yeah. And it should be done in hindsight, not at the immediate point. But that's, I think, forgive me, Ben, I think that's, um, that's not a cyber issue to fix. That's yeah. one for corporate governance to fix. But it is an issue that perpetrates into cyber. So when, when you're sat on the board as a CEO, you might have designed that comp package to incentivize your sales team to ramp up sales twice as quickly. Yep. So you might oh, absolutely. Say, oh, I'll shift it this way, knowing that it's a risk to security. But that's what oh, I Oh, absolutely. But, but, that, but, but if you allow that to happen, that means we haven't learned from Enron 20 years ago. Yeah, but, but I think what we're saying here is that there's an enormous amount of subjectivity and risk. And what you're trying to do is get this risk to be, the cyber risk to be counted in the same way as your financial risk or other business risks. And that is means you've got to have a conversation with a set of people that are not rational and don't understand the underlying technology. So yeah, I absolutely get your point that, that that's, you know, that, that, that's where I think I, I push back slightly. And I don't think it's a case of them being unrational. I think it's that whilst we're security people sat there thinking, we know this is a risk and we know this will destroy the business. The CEO sat there thinking like, yeah, I know that too. And I know that the risk, let's say for argument's sake is 50, 50, but I know that if I pump the resources into security to make that risk hundred percent, not there, then I've just lost out on the next quarter sales, lost my key investors and lost the business. So I know that kills me. So it's more a case of like, they're gambling that they're going to get it right, knowing that the odds are against them. So I have to run. It was like a pleasure chatting everybody. Um, but uh, um, good luck. Maybe we'll get there someday. <laughs> See you there next you year, Aaron. <laughs> right. <laughs> See ya. So I think we veered somewhat dramatically away from Risk Omer's budget. Original. We've lost Omer as well, we're somewhere. Talking to the board and executives. Um, yes, and we've lost Omer. Uh, so I, I think we're 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 moving we're moving upstream, but but not necessarily having done what we needed to where we were. I think Omer had a very good idea. Um, I think Aaron brought a very good perspective, which is we don't measure risk in measurements; we measure it in estimates. And I completely agree that we need to improve our measurements if we want to get better at doing anything with risk, whether or not it's communicating or estimating or whatever it might be. Um, I think observable facts that feed into risk analysis is, is kind of the answer here. Um, I think presentational techniques to the board are many and varied, and I happen to have a presentation on that, but... Um, actually, if we're, you know, garbage in and garbage out, I think I think that is a problem, and I think that's that is a an issue that I think we can try and solve. And I think we've had these conversations now a few times with Omer and and various people talking about what can we measure, what what can we observe, what facts can we observe, and the unfortunate thing is we keep then diving into what does it mean and why should we bother and what, who cares what it's going to end it's not going to and somehow i think we need to pull back on to actually let's talk about measurement again yeah um not for its own no, sake I, but for what it I, teaches. I, I, phil I, I absolutely agree with you i mean one of the things that i uh, picked up on is to your criticism of the vendors you know if you think about the uh, the response argument they've been pushing us to improve detection and therefore using the mean the measure um, business isn't interested in how long it takes to discover something. they're interested in how long it takes us to fix it such that they can get back to recover from an incident that is the measure that the business is interested in and we don't do that because most of the time 
uh, the, the CIO in particular is just interested in, resort, in restoring service. That's not actually fixing the problem. Um, that, that's, I think, to, to your point about measurements, I'm, I'm absolutely with you. you know, the, the business mantra of, well, if you're not measuring it, you're not doing it. You know, that's what's driven certainly big enterprise, large enterprise for the last 20 years. Um, and 20 years is you know, figure plucked from the sky, but, but, but for a significant period, we don't do that very well in cyber at all. The closest we get to it, I think, is how quickly do you patch your enterprise to a 95% level? That's the sort of tactical numbers that we have. That's irrelevant to the board. They're not interested in that. Right, but I, I would say we can come up with something that is relevant to the board. The problem is our 95% number is based on configuration management databases that are wrong, is based on, uh, you know, those numbers don't work. Uh, they don't uh, work. Oh, I agree. I mean, I, 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 I um, was reflecting, I think it was a conversation on Tuesday. So uh, I um, invested in a seam tool, got the right logs, because we got it wrong before, so I kind of learned, so we got the logs. We ended up with a better view of the environment than the network operations, service operations team did. And they actually asked for access to my SIEM database to allow them to monitor their estate. And I said, oh, you've got your SolarWinds tool, use your SolarWinds tool. You know, I'm using my logarithm for what I want to do. And they said, yeah, but your view is better. And I said, yeah, I know, I paid for it. Ah. If you want access to it, give me some money to contribute to it because you're using it as well. And we went collaborative. But it, it was not my immediate, it was not my gut reaction when first asked. I had to be pressed into doing it. But now as I reflect back on it, that was the right thing to do for the good of the business because I had, I, my team, had the best view of the estate, the better view of the estate but we didn't have a CMDB. I had a vulnerability database and a patch database, um, a patch status database, and indeed a view of the outside world that I could take that view as to which vulnerabilities were a risk and which were not. We were able to feed that into the, uh, into the infrastructure team and allow them to do something with it. But I didn't measure that in a way, and I certainly didn't report on it to the board which in hindsight I think was a mistake because we were showing active risk management of the estate, but we weren't telling anybody. So I think one of the other interesting perspectives that I think I've got from both Aaron and Omer's view, um, and I'm aware I'm talking, talking for them rather than with them, um, both of them were talking about measurements for the teams that were running things. So um, Omer was talking about risk budgets in how they can be applied to um, engineering teams. Aaron was talking about, you know, why is risk being assessed by people who don't understand the system, not rather than the people who are running the system. Um, I think there's a, there's a very important point there that maybe we are failing our engineering colleagues by reporting on them rather than for them? No, I, I think so, which is, I think is where uh, Denis not here, but uh, listening to Denis talk about now that he's wearing both VP engineering and CISO hat at the same time, he's always talking to production about what his security team are doing and he's driving that collaboration. And that's what prompted me to think back to, well, actually I ended up doing that, but it was reluctantly. Whereas now, if I think about it, I'd probably do it wholeheartedly enthusiastically because I've kind of learned that actually this is a team game I can't do I can't fix everything from the security side um, I am mostly a gamekeeper an oversight a, um, a, 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 a threats and warnings system it need, I need the IT service team to react in a way and to do that I've got to give them the information so I'm I'm doing a very similar thing. Uh, apologies, guys. I've, I'm going to have to drop off for half past for another call. But thanks for the conversation. Catch you all yeah. tomorrow. Cheers. On the, I, I've been building a thing that we call the security rig, um, and it's basically we're taking existing data sources 
uh, an existing instrumentation. We're not adding anything for security. We're pumping it into an analytics engine and then we're providing views of that in a security context back to the engineering team so they can see how far behind they are on patching. They can see how far they are from, from compliance. They can see how many bugs are getting introduced at various stages of the pipeline. And the point is not for me to then have a stick to go and beat them with. It's for them to be able to measure their own performance. Uh, I am wondering what the next step for this conversation is, because we've had this same conversation around risk budgets about three times now. Um, I think we need to start stepping back from risk in this conversation and step towards instrumentation. Um, and, and I think our next step is going to have to be to find examples of successful security instrumentation that we can use to build a framework to think about risk budgets. So just to throw some industry, uh, sorry, throw some examples out there. There are some really nice metrics that you've talked about, Phil, that are relatively well defined, you know, um, percentage of uh, things that are patched, open CVs, et cetera, et cetera. Um, there's a group in America called the Cyber ITL, um, who are doing binary analysis of software, looking at a looking at a variety of measures to produce um, effectively a scorecard. So they're looking at uh, presence of safety features, um, code hygiene, so the presence or not of 500, uh, 500 functions. Um, yeah. With with some of these um, with some of these ones, they are let, let's take. Um, uh, calls to store copy is a really dumb example. You may have in your in your C or C plus plus binary, you may have two thousand of those. It's an indicator, but there is a, a percentage of those are probably fine, uh, but a small percentage are probably not. Um, as we as we move through the set of metrics, so the, there are the ones at the start which are very yeah, a very strong correlation between you haven't patched you need to because as we move into some of the other uh, metrics the they become a lot more uncertain it's not clear they're, they're bad smells i don't know how you i don't know how when even even in terms of feedback to engineering when you're talking about budget uh a rip time budget how you can communicate to them you have Okay, you have you have some you have metrics here that indicate badness, but we can't um, uh, we can't quantify that. Yes, I mean, yeah. So the even identifying a metric of badness is is presenting a mental model. So yep. you know, if th this more than zero of this or is is going to be bad. I can't tell you how bad, but we know it's bad. Um, the the general estimation that if you've got a hundred of these, it's really bad, is one way of doing it. Then pulling in data that says where we have had breaches, we've seen that we've always had a hundred of these, is another way yeah. of doing it. There are ways and means by which we can gather observable facts which will allow us to provide a weighting to our belief that something is bad. Okay. And I, and I think, are... go on. Uh, sorry, go on. Well, no, I, I think there's some real value in sitting down with security metrics and thinking to ourselves, how do I measure the environment to tell me measuring is a good or a bad thing? You know, it sounds like a bad thing, but is it actually, or is it a bad enough thing for me to worry about? There's, there's lots of, there's lots of metrics out there that people in different situations have measured for, uh, for software and do measure. Um, some are, as I said, some are much more certain than others, and it's in the, it's in the latter stages or the effectiveness. Uh, not sorry, not the effectiveness. It's in the importance. It's like okay, well, we've measured A, B, C, D. Uh, a is low, C is low, B is uh, sorry. A, a is A is low, B is low, C is higher, and D is higher. Well, what's the right order of 
what do you address first? Now, which is the higher risk? Where do you spend your engineering, uh, your engineering uh, time? Is at best, I think, for me, an, a, a, a guess or an opinion. So I think what would be interesting, and maybe this goes back to Aaron's point, is could we identify an approach to instrumentation which is kind of agnostic to the thing you're instrumenting but would allow you to learn the goodness and badness of the things that are being measured could, could we make a framework approach that allows us to build a goodness or badness measure that's interesting because that puts the tool in people's hands to be able to build their own contextual risk metrics that's that that would be an interesting next step if we could work out how to do that i it sounds to me like we are running out of steam um so unless anybody has uh topics of interest to raise at this point uh, i think i might call this to a close does anyone have any more to add Okay. Um, Sorry, forgive me, Phil. Um, just what's the demand side looking like from the business? So you, we, we're recognizing that what we're doing at the moment is not getting the, is often not getting the desired response from the business. So we're recognizing that. But what I'm not hearing from the business side, i.e. the demand side of the conversation, is what is it that they do want from us? So have you, have you tested this thought on need for improved measurement, need for instrumentation to take the, I'm going to so, say the ambiguity out of what we do. Is, is, that, is that the sort of feedback that you're responding to? Uh, to an extent, uh, there are a number of interesting surveys. Scientia Institute, you did some brilliant ones talking to board members about reporting. Um, what did they want from reporting? What did they want to hear? And it was entirely not what we'd all been telling each other. So everyone talks about, oh, security needs to be an enabling function. We need to build the business. And almost all board members surveyed came back and said, security is not an enabling function. Just stop my money getting stolen. You know, <laughs> that's what I'm asking you to do. I'm not asking you to go and be a consultancy to my business. I've got a business already. Go and protect it. Um, and there was some very non-intuitive answers, which in hindsight were obvious that came out of that. So, but some of that was around how much they trusted data they were being given and what sort of data or visualizations and the like they preferred and trusted more i think if you take some of those survey results and then you look at the CISO roundabout um, you look at the disquiet over cyber budgets that have inflated and apparently not delivered anything because they keep trying to inflate and further um, what you're seeing is people in executive roles or non-executive roles turning around and saying i don't get it i don't get this CISO. i don't get this reporting i don't understand what i'm doing get another one and so we're not seeing them turn around and saying you're not giving me a b c and d what we're seeing is them we're saying go we're going to get someone else in because frankly i don't think you know most people have seen good it's a bit like saying why did nobody in the 1890s tell anyone else what an electric car should look like because they'd never seen a car let alone an electric car do you know what i mean it was a um so when they've seen good you get great results from a board i just think most boards have never seen good and what you're getting from them is disquiet and grumbling and my view is that's because they don't trust what they're being told yeah they, I, I, we don't sorry. trust what we're telling them so yes, I think you know, when we're pressed, our, our evidential data to support our hypothesis is weak. I absolutely agree with that. But I do think there's an element of not liking what they're being told because we're calling them out for taking effectively unassessed risk. With the, the, we're, we're calling them out, you know, and particularly here I'm thinking about my friction with the CIO because 
he or she is thinking about availability and I'm wanting them to think about integrity and resiliency. And that's, that's, those are luxuries perhaps that they don't want to spend on. So they don't like that message. So, I mean, yeah, one of the... Um, so it's been interesting. My experience has been that there are some executives who see security as toxic, expensive yeah. and toxic. And as long as it's nowhere near them, they're happy. Mm -hmm. But they tend not to have been very good executives in a whole bunch of areas, not just in dealing with security. Yes. My experience is that those who are good CEOs, good CFOs, good CROs, whatever role they've got, when you sit down and have a conversation where they trust you, where they understand what you're saying, and when they challenge you, you're able to rise to the challenge, you get a better result, um, even if they're not happy about it. So I do think, yes, some people won't want to be told that can't be known. You know, if I, there are always going to be some execs, you go to them and say, I don't know how bad that's going to be, but you need to give me a load of money for it, who are going to go mental. What the hell are you doing even talking to me? And then there are the others that go, so why are you talking to me about it? Hmm. You then get the opportunity to explain that to me. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I've said this before we are not going to improve security reporting to the point at which bad executives become good. <laughs> no, no, absolutely. That, no, that's a good point. One of the, <laughs> so, so uh, forgive me if uh, I've, I've missed this strand earlier, but one of the areas where I was able to affect change wasn't directly. It was by using non-execs and my audit and risk committee to apply to some extent pressure onto the executives because that audit and risk committee did understand risk, did understand that I was flagging amb ambiguity and, and lack of comfort with that ambiguity. And they were able to say, um, we need to do something more about this. That does not necessarily mean throw more money at it because uh, at the beginning of that conversation, it was about not having access to the data that we needed to improve our monitoring regime. That was my early blind spot, if you will. But then when I did get that, it was about getting the business leads and the subsidiaries to recognize that actually they needed to dance to the central tune more because they were, they were operating out of tolerance, to use your expression. Um, that was actually presenting more of an aggregate risk back to the corporation because of what they were doing in their small part of the business. That was something the Audit and Risk Committee picked up on, that the execs, some of the execs who owned those profit centres, um, didn't want me to surface. And, and I've circumvented it. Didn't win me friends, well, and, but I got this, the message through. This is the whole avoidance of feedback. Hmm. So I don't want, avoidance of feedback is someone saying, I don't want to, be, to show that I'm failing at something. Mm -hmm. And the problem is if you, if you don't learn from your failures, as Aaron was saying earlier, you, you get killed by the big failure because you didn't learn from the little ones. Correct, um, yes. So when, when you do finally get that third party audit turn up, it all comes out. <laughs> um, so, but I, I still am interested in this idea of what can we do with actual observable facts? Not just, yeah, agreed. you know, questions that we ask people over the phone and we get answers and we say that's red, amber, green. But actually, what can we measure an instrument about the environment that bypasses the people and the politics? Yes, because um, fact is hard to argue with. Yeah. And I think, um, I think the next steps for this conversation have to be to start with people who are instrument instrumenting their environments before we step back up into the risk conversation again, because otherwise we're back into a, a conversation of the theory of talking to board members rather than um, what should no, we and, what is it no, Absolutely, and, th and there's no point trying to do what we've tried before, um, because we're just going to have the same result. So absolutely, we've got to do something different earlier in the, in the, uh, in the thinking piece. Agreed. So without say, saying too much about, about what risk led you to, um, we're connecting like the companies in terms of a supply chain. So we build up these graphs and maps. I think Phil, you've seen one of the graphs that I showed you in terms of the yep. web of all these organisations and, and the connections between them. 
And as part of that, one of the things we've thought about doing is that we always have like a list of the controls that each one of those orgs has implemented. So it's not as granular, I think, as like instrumentation within a tech environment, but it's pretty granular in terms of like the control level kind of statements. Um, and one of the things we've been interested in trying to do is almost combine that with a bit of threat intelligence to show you when those organizations have been breached and then try and basically map what controls an organization has against their chances of being breached to see if we can almost weight the controls to the way organizations are breached in, in real life. If that makes sense, which almost, I, is that kind of a parallel to what you're saying there around moving risk or understanding risk at a more granular level in terms of probabilities and, and quantifying it? Yes, uh, although, so I think there's some real value in what you're talking about doing. I think it'd be a very interesting piece of analysis. I think there's a challenge in that you need to ensure that you're comparing appropriate risk profiles with like with like. Because um, it may be that I get breached more because I'm in retail. But, then, than, so that like, also then, but that triggers kind of a similar thought to what I was thinking earlier when you guys were having this discussion around that I do think risk is so contextual and that it changes almost like every literally every second in terms of both the, the we have a view of risk in terms of we're cyber professionals and we don't want data to be leaked and always that's our mission whereas the business's mission is they want to make money and those two things are not always the same um, and it's almost like in from day to day even the way the business and the way that you would view that risk would then change day to day as well so it becomes kind of like a such a moving target that I don't know if, if quantifying it would help because the calibration of the, the tools would have to change. Well, what might be interesting is if you, if we had a definition of a risk budget for DLP, for example, what is the um, security uh, objective for a DLP service? What would be the budget of failure for a DLP service? If there was a common industry language for describing that, you could ask for the measurements in the supply chain. So it's not just the case that someone said they've got DLP. It's the fact that they turned around and said, we've got a DLP. We let about 10% of bad things get past than we, we would otherwise want to. Um, but we never go beyond 12% sort of thing. Um, that starts getting a bit more interesting in terms of being able to instrument the control effectiveness down the supply chain. You know, it's not just did they tell us they had it on a questionnaire. It's actually here are the here are the measurements that come out of the environment about its operation. Uh, and, and yeah, it's a bit I completely, the sky, but. completely agree with the effectiveness of that. But the immediate thought then jumps into my head, and I think I'm just having an even where I'm thinking about business and security as two separate things. Is that no business would ever want to have that data because they wouldn't want to to really present it. I don't think. Especially well, well, no CISO would ever want that data because no CISO would ever want to present it because no like CISO ever wants to show that they're not meeting the target. Um, interestingly, though, if you spoke to a CEO and said, would you like to have that data? They'd, they'd be like, yeah, why not? I'm not saying they'd share it probably is, is the, better, the better way I should phrase that. So they, they would only share it if they know that, that they, they have the best looking data out of everyone in their pool. And I think this is um, why. Oh, Dred, Dreds, for, forgive me. I think I think you're uh, um, you're tarring all CISOs with the same brush. There, yeah. I th I think there are some CISOs, and this probably comes to where are they in their maturity? That might be time in in role, because actually, if I've only just arrived, I am going to surface bad data because I'm going to use that to drive whatever improvement program I'm going to run. But actually, even those who've been there a good while, mature, they've actually probably got enough, they've built up enough trust in their business to be able to say, Do you know, we've been looking at this data and we think we've missed a trick. This is what we're now seeing because we've done this. They've got confidence to show bad data because if it was me, I'd rather be doing that than have somebody else blowing the whistle on me. Yeah. I'd like to control that narrative by getting front foot forward, by getting ahead of the problem. So, and that's a confidence thing, but I don't think that, I think, I think those two types of CISOs that would embrace that bad data are very much in the minority. That's certainly not the majority of CISOs. But I was well, like, like the CEOs in terms of then sharing that data to be able to almost implement uh, like a tool like Phil's talking about where we can actually have the data to be able to understand 
um, these kind of minutiae within the risk. I think that there's almost a barrier there where the business would not want to share that data with other businesses and you'd need to... Add oh, well, absolutely. Yeah, and we, we've seen that. I mean, you know, the, the telcos fought that for years and had their Friday afternoon uh, closeted telephone call with no notes taken as a way of getting around their general counsel forbidding them to talk to everybody. Right, but, but here's the thing. If you look at the financial accounts of a business and you look at their strategy, they go to industry analysts and sell themselves based on the numbers that they are forced to publish and the strategies that they claim they're following. And they, there is a whole little industry of trying to make true things look as good as possible. But no company <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> to do financial reporting because they're embarrassed by their finances, apart from you know, the ones that are imminently about to go bust. Um, I, I absolutely agree with that. But having so the only having, reason we're shy about cyber at the moment is because nobody else shows it. Nobody's asking us to show it. But, but yes. Take 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 the financial example. So I've had that thrown back at me a couple of times. Can we predict financial stability? Let's say in the supply chain, based on everyone publishing their accounts. No, because they won't publish it to the level of detail that we need. And even when they do, the accountants have fiddled it so much that it that it looks good, like you say. So like it's uh, it's almost like a, a even when you force people to publish it or they get comfortable in publishing it they're, they're never I don't think able to publish it the detail that you would need to implement something like we're talking about well it's interesting you need to be an expert in the data so uh, you know a friend of mine is able to pick up a financial report and he can tell me if a business is recovering from big loss or if it's building towards a big bit of growth just by looking at that year's annual accounts. You give him a couple of years annual accounts, he'll tell you how long that business has got left to live. Um, you know, there's only, you can fudge the accounts, you can be Enron and you get caught, but oh, there's more that in there. To experience. Or Tesco's. <laughs> but, but there's more in there in terms of cash, in terms of top line, bottom line, in terms of, you know, and, and you can only hold stuff up for so long before it, it, it appears on the balance sheet. I agree, it's not it's not necessarily easy. And from a security point of view, it probably wouldn't go down to a controls thing. Um, if you look at um, ESG reporting, uh, so uh, ethical social governance reporting. Uh, so this is a mandatory requirement for people that are listed on Hong Kong Stock Exchange. Uh, and it's a common requirement for public listed companies to produce for ethical investors. And it's about do you you know what's your green footprint are you involved in modern slavery how good are you on cyber and data protection how, there's a whole series of topics that you have to produce an equivalent annual report on which isn't about the money now at the moment i'll be honest they're terrible there's there's nothing to know in them they've got you know mo around cyber most of them have got somewhere around 14 to 17 facts that you could probably have guessed um but there's a there's an angle there about collecting ESG reports, putting them together, comparing them, showing them to people that says, well, why are you only giving people two of the cyber facts where everyone else gives them 14? You know, to the same degree that happens with financial reporting. And ultimately it becomes the analysts and the investors. And the investors say, I want this information because you're not giving it to me and they are, and they're doing okay. And I don't know how you're doing. Um, yeah, I, I, I think there's something in doubling down on ESG reporting and, and using that as a little bit of leverage on increasing transparency. But once again, we are moving well away from yeah. instrumentation and measurement uh, and back into uh, high level governance topics. <laughs> cool, I need to run off anyway, but uh, thank you guys for the, the great chat. No worries. Cool, Alan, have you got uh, anything else to add? No, I will guess not. Sorry, uh, for, forgive me. No, I'm just Googling your ethical social governance reporting bit because that's the first I've, I've heard it referenced with the cyber dimension. Uh, so oh, you thank you for that. Answer. I'm going to go have a look. <laughs> <laughs> no, they're, they're generally anodyne and unuseful, but um, there is, I, I think there's an interesting point of leverage to be had there. Yes, uh, I can see that potential. Just before we do drop, um, one, one reminder to, to Hayden, but I guess it's a point for us. 
if we do if when we start pooling that corporate data such that we can take a view of of the breadth side of it i think we have to be careful about how that could be misused because it will identify who is exposed and if i was the bad guy i'd be very interested in that because that's the weakest link and if you think about that supply Hello. chain ecosystem they need to know that so if I was a bad guy, do I need to understand that or do I just hit everybody and take what I can get? Well, so yes, that's the scattergun approach and they're doing very well. Yeah. So, uh, you know, are we exposing ourselves any more than just by being connected badly? Uh, no, that's a, look, that's a, that's a good response. Absolutely. <laughs> um, we're making it so, okay, so agreed. We're making it too easy for them across the board. But as we get better, you know, if you think about we're hardening individual companies, we're starting to, starting to improve connected companies as they attack their supply chain risk piece. So there are beginning to be pockets of, if you do so the analogy that I've got in my head is the hardening of buildings in the square mile and the soft targets are just outside of the square mile. Uh, we have that situation, I think, at the moment in our ecosystem where there are enterprises that, that have raised the bar and hardened, you know, reduced their attack surface and all of those good things. But there are elements in their supply chain that actually still mean they're Achilles heels. And, and those are the ones that if I was the bad guy, not doing scattergun, so I suppose spear phishing, that's who I go after. And I bet you could guess who they were without any seeing the data. Yes, I probably have. Yes, that's no, that's that's very true. No, good. Yes, I could guess. In fact, I wouldn't even be guessing. It would be an educated guess. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> that's all right. So, so to your question, no, I have nothing else to offer to, to this conversation. Okay, so we have seven minutes yet uh, left uh, for the summit. Um, do we want, uh, I, I, because uh, some uh, five minutes for recap, or you already think that it is fine? Uh, I could do a very quick recap. Okay. Uh, so this was a session on risk budgets at the Open Security Summit in 2020. Uh, we had a useful conversation. Again, uh, we delved much more into uh, instrumentation of systems, uh, the use of metrics towards risk budgets uh, as something that we can make from observable facts. Uh, however, we did also spend a lot of time talking about how we talk to boards, how we talk to each other and how we deal in our supply chains. Uh, we still don't have any answers, uh, but it sounds like our next steps may well be to bring some instrumentation examples to bear uh, and to think potentially about a framework for how you would identify measurements that show you badness, uh, to be twisty in our language. Um, so another great conversation. I'm not sure we've moved the art forward dramatically, but uh, you know, here's to next time. Thank you, Phil. And uh, anybody else want to add something? Uh, I can uh, okay Alan uh, do you want to add anything uh, just just my thanks to Phil Omar Aaron Ben I found that a fascinating conversation I absolutely accept Phil's implicit criticism that we haven't moved the dial enough um, but I found that enlightening so thank you Okay, so thank you everyone. Really great talk, great uh, conversation and hopefully next by next year we can find answers for the questions that you arose because yes, we need to measure and uh, just uh, create a real budget or something like that that can be then financed. So if no other questions, I'm stopping recording. Again, thank you, everyone. You did great.